Hi, everybody. Today's pre-accident podcast is brought to you by Underwriters Laboratory, Worker Health and Safety. Now, they've got a new 11-module program, and the entire reason they're sponsoring the podcast is to introduce you to these modules. So the first title we're going to release is more informational for organizations, and it's really designed to help educate the entire population related to the new view of safety. So we get into looking at how the best-in-class organizations are utilizing these techniques to drive improvement, but ultimately set up the rest of the content that will be coming online at the end of the first quarter. This first module will be available for free, and uh, we'll announce soon when you're able to access that content as well as where. Thank you. All this at ulworkplace.com. Now, let's listen to the podcast. How how many in UG safety people does it take to figure out whether the machine's recording? And the quick answer is all of them. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I am your hopeful host, Todd Conklin. Thanks for listening. It is good to see you again. How have you been? Oh, my goodness. It has been crazy. The year is always crazy. There has. It seems like this year's uh, – it seems like there's a lot to do this year. I don't know. I, you know, I'm struggling through all the normal crap everyone struggles through, getting stuff done and paying bills and doing – crazy junk for people that I have to do and <clears throat> all the stuff that we do. I don't know. It's, it seems um, stupid to complain about it because quite honestly, who cares, right? I mean, even I don't care and it's my complaint. You'd think I'd care the most, but I don't. Mostly though, really, if you pushed me, mostly it's pretty darn good time to be alive. That's what I think mostly. I don't know. I've been experimenting, doing a lot of experimental cooking Trying out a bunch of new ideas cooking-wise. I don't know if you uh, know about... I don't know if I've even told you about my macaroni and cheese pot pie. Yes, it's quite an adventure. I made little pot pies, and I put in really good macaroni and cheese, and then I put a lid on them, and I baked them. And uh, first you make the macaroni and cheese. So it's like already cooked macaroni and cheese, so don't 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 try this with... Well, it might work with raw noodles, but I wouldn't try it. And you bake them till the pie crust gets done. And then you have these, like, amazing macaroni and cheese pot pies that I don't know if anyone's had them before. I mean, I don't know if I'm, like, the first person on earth to ever create this. But it was a long story involving extra pie dough and macaroni and cheese that brought me to this point. And now I think I've got, well, I think I've got a product worthy of a state fair somewhere. I don't know which pie division it would go into. It's not a fruit pie. It's not a stone fruit. It is a, a savory pie. But it's really tasty. It's something about the crust and the cheese and the macaroni it's like starch served in starch and quite honestly who doesn't want that now if it can make the pie shell out of bacon ha now there my friends ha huh, maybe i should pause this podcast and work on that a little bit now let's talk about what we're going to talk about today uh sorry for the macaroni and cheese railroad there but uh I, did it make you hungry that'd be my big question uh, you know it's just something i'm thinking about so today is an entire podcast on how to coach a learning team. Man, have I been getting some feedback on this, baby. So learning teams are a tool. It's just a tool. It's definitely a tool of the new view. I don't think they're necessarily terribly earth-shattering or brilliant. It's not like a, it's not like macaroni and cheese pot pie, which is, you know, new to the surface of the earth. We've been doing learning teams in one form or another for, you know, eons for a really long time. Uh, it, it's just a tool that's easily available and highly profitable in sort of the data profit uh, use of the word. It's got a really high payoff for a low investment, and it works really well as a way to sort of introduce some new view thinking. It reads nicely down to the workers. It reads great up to leadership, and it gathers really good data. I think the reason they work so well is is the, the phenomena of engaging workers in problem identification and then using those same workers to do problem solution is really a, a shift. It's a it's a palpable, observable, touchable, measurable shift in the way we look at workers. We're changing from thinking of workers as a problem to be fixed. Let's do safety to the workers. These guys need to be better. We're actually now saying the workers become a resource that we can actually use to not only fix problems, but to predict problems and prevent problems. 
and it's really simple. But, boy, people want to make it so complicated. They want to formalize it and make a form, and why don't we have a web page, and we ought to certify facilitators, and all that's kind of wrong. And so that's why I put together a little team of folks who I think have a lot of experience on the learning team side of the house. Now, everyone talking in this meeting has done hundreds of learning teams, not not 10 or 1, hundreds. Pro- probably, actually, most of the people have done hundreds and hundreds of learning teams. And we just kind of sat around a table one evening and said, what does it take to actually coach learning teams? And the entire goal of this was to create a podcast that was open and shut. Bing, bang, boom, here you go. And I hope it is that kind of podcast for you. I hope this podcast makes a huge difference in the way you think about learning teams. Now, here's the secret. You put together a learning team. It's rather ad hoc by nature. You put together a learning team to do problem discovery and then solution planning. Problem discovery and solution planning. And those are two very distinct things. Remembering, of course, at a fundamental level, that people never learn and perform at the same time. A learning team stops the workers from performing long enough to engage them in learning, and then it allows them to tell you where the problem is and what the problem is, which is oftentimes very different than what you set out to find. And then then they tell you what you ought to do to fix it. And the only other thing I'll tell you is once you know what to fix, prioritize the things that should be fixed quickly and fix them, and remember the power of prototyping. You always can micro-experiment solutions. Try small solutions early. If they're good, use them. If they're bad, stop. Here we go. Listen carefully. See if you can identify who's on this little panel, and let's talk about the art of doing a learning team. This is the Pre-Accident Podcast Coaching Sessions. We've been doing a lot of operational learning, and we're finding that there's a tremendous value in how do you coach a learning session. So if you want to learn something instead of investigate it, you need some people that get it, that can actually be interested and be non-judgmental, or at least act like they're non-judgmental, so that we can talk to the guys close to the event and learn and improve. But I think the coaching piece is huge. Well, we're seeing it, because we've done hundreds of these now, right? So talk, so, about, talk about the coaching piece. Well, what makes that coaching different than other coaching? Yeah, well, or, so we or have, is it different? Well, we don't have a baseball, right, or oh, football. So I wasn't thinking that coaching. It's different, <laughs> it's different than that, right? But you do wear the weird shoes. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll Those coaching shoes? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so the, the thing about operational learning coaching that I see, and Marcy, you join in here too with anything mm-hmm. you've seen, um, is it takes someone that has some depth of knowledge in this sort of new view and that can, can really carry a group past this notion of this is not an investigation. This is not an interrogation. We're not looking for a sort of who done it. We're really interested in learning how it happened and really understanding the struggles of the guys that do the work. I love what Marcy said on the podcast you did with her earlier that she goes out there and spends time with the guys to really learn how they do their work as opposed to going out there to do a compliance audit on them. So how do you know you're how do you know you're doing it right? Are you surprised? Are you surprised by what you learn? Well, I know I'm doing it right because I'm from Tennessee. And that just kind of naturally <laughs> makes it, right? I mean, I just, Is that part going to get edited out? <laughs> I'm going to volunteer. Aren't you the volunteer? Yeah, I, we are the volunteers. I'm going to volunteer, volunteer that you take that out, yeah. yeah. So, so Marcy, how would you say we know we've done it right? If you're coaching a session, how do you know it, that coaching is working? Well, it's, it's when people start unlocking the story, start sharing information, start participating. Because in the beginning, when you have an organization that's just starting the journey, there's some skepticism. There's, you know, the, all the baggage from before the new view, they're, they're still carrying that. So they're, 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 in a, they're observing to see whether it's true what you're saying, whether there's no malintent, we're really trying to improve, learn and improve. And so if, if the coach is doing a, a good job of explaining the concept, the overall concept, and what will be done with the information, then I think we, what we've seen is people willing to share what they know about the event and the work process and 
I don't think it's really surprising to see that they're totally invested in making things better for everybody because you know, they they are equally affected by any of the injuries or events that occur. Yeah, if not more so, right? I mean, Absolutely. Can, yeah. And do you ever notice this that when you're when you're starting a session out with people that's never been on a learning team before, that they kind of look at you at first like, is this some clever new interrogation? <laughs> yes. It's a group interrogation, <laughs> is there a trick? right? Yes. Yeah. There is a trick here. Yes. And, but you're right. Then once they and I think that's what I look for too is once the story they're telling me starts to get pretty messy, then we're getting real. Right? That's yes. what I'm not. I'm not looking for everybody's stories to line up. I mean, I used to. You probably never did this, but I hate to admit this. And well, I can admit it because I guess I can, right? So I used you're from to, Tennessee. I'm from Tennessee, right? And we can. But I used to do. I mean, I would go talk to people individually and get their story individually, and then kind of get together with some of the leadership and figure out what they really did and look for holes in their stories. I mean, what am I? CSI? It's crazy. Now what do we do? We bring everybody together and say, hey, we just want to understand the complexity of your work. Tell us what you have to deal with. What are your struggles like? But at, right at first, sometimes they do kind of look at you like, okay, are you really shooting straight with me? Or, But the beauty of it is once they participate in a good learning team and they open up and they're, and they're finished with that, that task or the learning team, what they do is they go out yes. and they talk to everybody else and they say, Oh, that's not what I thought. It was really a very good thing. And, you know, this is the outcome of it. These are the things that we're changing and it's all for the good. And that spreads like wildfire. Yeah. And, yeah. and so then when that happens, when another learning team opportunity comes, you have people that are less resistant to participating and you're building more trust, you're building more capacity and gathering more operational intelligence that you can build back into your systems. So that's, that's what I'm, you know, I'm seeing. Do you ever see people ask to be on a learning team? Yes. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yes. I mean, nobody ever asked me, hey, can I be on that investigation? Will you interrogate me, yes. please? Right. Yes. Isn't that cool when you actually have people say, hey, when can I be on a learning team? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because now their thoughts and opinions and their uh, expertise is, is valued and they, they, they get that and, and they want to help. And so that's why they, they ask for those yeah. opportunities and it's, it's a great cool. thing. Yeah. So what's your coaching technique? What's your tips? How do you coach one? Uh, take me from start to finish maybe. Can you do that? Yeah, sure. So some event happens. And Marcy, chime in with anything you've got to here. Some event happens, it's a near miss, or it's a quality escape, or I don't know, we blow up a transformer and then blow it up again in two days, something like that, <laughs> right? And uh, so we we get the guys together. As a coach, I, I oftentimes help sort of formulate the team. Who do we need in here? Because my goal is, is to learn. So if I'm going to learn, I need people that are close to the work. So we sort of decide... It's not going to be a huge team, six, seven people, maybe five, but people close to it. And then when I bring, when they come together, we pull away from the work because I think it's really hard to learn while you're working. I think you need to I agree. stop for a minute, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Step away from the work. I, I and, and then we have a basic conversation. I usually kick it off with, um, hey, I know this may seem a little strange at first, but it's not an investigation. We just really want, I, I'm going to make a basic assumption. Nobody wanted this to happen. We didn't mean to blow up the transformer twice. We didn't mean to blow it up the first time. And so let's just talk about how, you know, you, you guys teach me about your work world. As a coach, you have to be really, really teachable. And I mean, kind of humble about it. Don't, don't go in thinking you have the answers. And then as, this, as they start to open up and share with you, and you saw this happen, Marcy, they'll, they'll, a lot of times they'll jump in and want to start solving. So yes. as a coach, we got to slow them down and say, wait a minute. That's, that's human nature. Yes. <laughs> Let's just take this first learning session and just learn. Just teach me. We've already propped it up. There's already, you know, we stopped the league, stopped the bleed, stopped the whatever. We do that immediately. Now we want to learn. So as a coach, I think one of the most valuable things you can do is be interested and ask good questions, ask meaningful questions, and listen to them, which will lead you to more good questions. People ask me a lot of times, well, what questions do you start with? Well, I, I don't know. It's different for everyone. But if I'm interested, if I found out, Todd, that you jumped these squirrel suits from, you know, along the side of cliffs, I, I would be very interested. I have a lot of questions for you, just naturally, because it's interesting to me. I would, If I were jumping wearing a squirrel suit off the edge of a cliff, I would be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so that's what it seems to really help is that as a coach, my goal is to learn enough from them that they've explained it well enough to me that I look at the whole situation and say, you know what, 
given that information and that set of conditions, I bet I'd have done the same thing. What do you think, Marcy? I agree. And I, and I think a great starting point is just to ask them, well, what's normal work look like? Yep. And start that conversation. And, and of course, they, they know exactly what that is. And uh, I think they uh, understand better when we start off with that question that we're valuing what they're sharing with us in the specific steps that they take to get the work done. And then we can have, we can evolve that conversation to something much more meaningful regarding the event. Yeah, but you, so you don't start at the event either. I don't. I usually start back in the process of their work yeah. and kind of work towards the event. You ever reach a situation where when you get to the event itself, you don't even really need to talk about the event? It's so obvious that it happened because of all of the conditions and system weaknesses and production pressure and conditions, yeah. latent conditions. You ever see that where you really especially don't even when have to... you have a bunch of good people on your team that are opening up and sharing that? Yeah, it yep. becomes very self evident. Yep, and you get close to the event, you're like, "Well, I'm glad that's all that happened." <laughs> but don't don't you feel in a way like you're asking people to sort of notice the obvious? Not the not the people on the team, but like management. You're saying to management, "You don't know how work is done." And but, you need to go and ask how work is done. But we and management saying things like, well, uh, I think I know how work's done. Right. I mean, I have my idea, but the, it seems really, I don't know, to me it's kind of like, uh, it's its really odd. Managers don't really need us to come and tell them that. All they have to do is just go out and look at how the work's done. Yeah, so that's, but you're, you're right, except that. They have a million things pulling on them. Yeah, that's so, true. So a coach has that ability to say, hey, I, I'm the, sort of the voice of the story. And, and we have to tell that story to the leadership. You know, it's, we become an advocate for the learning team. We become an advocate for the story. I agree with Bob. And especially with organizations that are just starting the journey, building the trust. Sometimes when you have the higher level managers involved, that kind of um, slants the perspective of the people that are involved and what kind of story they tell. So uh, I think I think that uh, it's a better story when we don't have them initially present. And I think then they find out, you know, how much they really did know or did not know. And that's yeah. the value. Yep. Because I think we tend to tell managers what we think managers want to hear the overall. So if we can kind of have them step away for a moment, like my site manager for several years when we were doing this, he would come in to the, at the beginning of a learning session and say, guys, thanks for coming together. I know this is going to be a complex, messy story. I don't care how messy it is. Just talk about it. I'll check back in with you later. You guys just unlock this. Help me build a system that will be strong enough to, that you know we can have less of these sort of events. And then he would leave. So he kind of gave him permission to talk about it, yeah, and then he stepped out of there so that we could actually get into the weeds. Yeah. yeah, that's a great thing. And so I've done presentations with pretty high-level leaders with the flip chart from the learning teams. I don't sanitize it down to one or two PowerPoint slides. I go into the fancy boardrooms and put up the flip charts and tell the story of how it happened. So you do, as a coach, become the advocate for that team. I had a, I had a situation once where it was involving an engineering issue, and one of the engineers said, Bob, will you come tell the story to our leadership because it could be career limiting for me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what, you're not worried about my career? <laughs> oh. Yeah, but we do. We become the voice for that yeah. for that story. But I, but I would advocate that it, once you get further along in the journey and you've built that working relationship and the trust, uh, that I would recommend that the high-level managers take the opportunity to go out and find out what the blue line oh, is yeah, like. Totally. I, I think they'll get a lot of value out of that, mm -hmm. not just for themselves, but for the organization as a whole, because they'll see what kind of importance you're putting on safety. Yep. And because the managers don't touch the tools, right, or because it's been a long time since they've actually done that type of work, they pretty much know they're out of touch, right? I mean, they must. I don't know. It depends. I, I mean, I see a lot of times where they have sort of that, you know, we talk about the black line, blue line all the time. They sort of have that high level, this is how we plan the work. Why aren't people following the plan? I see that a bunch, Todd, where they, they, they think they know because they help put the plan together, but they don't really know the variability and the drift and the challenges and the operator struggles. And even our, some of our tools, like our lean tools with standard work, doesn't do a very good job of capturing variability, but talk to the workers. They have variability all day long they're dealing with. So this fallacy of every day being the same, right, which is what we're talking about, right. is that our plans assume one thing at a fundamental level. 
And that is every day is exactly like every other day. The problem is, is reality does not deal that deck of cards. <laughs> right. right. Every day is very different. Right. It strikes me that going out and coaching these teams to learn from themselves, really you're doing two things. And correct me if I'm wrong. You're coaching them to problem discover, and then you're coaching them to problem solve. Right. And they're distinctly different activities. Right. In fact, one gets in the way of the other. Right, because if you jump in and start solving too quickly, and don't you love how Todd asks questions? He totally already knows the answer, but he (laughs) asks these questions to get us involved in the, to to kind of guide us. The discussion, yes. Right, so maybe he would be a really good coach. Oh, wait, he is a really good coach, isn't he? Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I think you're exactly right, because once you jump into fix-it mode, you just drop off of learning. Yes. And and I I did this a couple of times with early learning teams that I did. Um, Someone would suggest something really good, and I'd say, Okay, we're not going to talk about that now because Todd taught us not to, right? But I'll just put it on the parking lot. As soon as I said that, someone else would say, oh, yeah, could you also put my idea on the parking lot? And it just turned into a feeding frenzy of fix Solutions. Solutions, yes. Yeah. So I've learned to stop. You could, I think I may have mentioned this in our earlier podcast. You can give me the cure for cancer. I won't write it down in that first session. We'll talk about it later. But right now, we're just going to keep them in learning mode. It's hard to do that. Yeah, that that demands... That demands a level of, of maturity. And discipline. And, right? Yeah, discipline is probably better than maturity. And what's crazy is simultaneously you're asking for leaders to let go of control. Or, yeah, so you right. increase discipline while decreasing control. It's a pretty hard sell the first yes. time. How do you sell them the first time? Because once they see them mm-hmm. and be a part of them and get the results from them, it's pretty self-explanatory. Right. But that first time, what, what do you trick them? Do you uh, use <laughs> I do a hip, card trick. Hypnosis. I didn't think you, hypnosis. You are getting sleepy. That's I use you. acupuncture. <laughs> oh, acupuncture. Yeah, I, but I think really, truly, the best way is let us do one. It's the very thing. I mean, you, you know, once again, you, you're you leaving me in with the question, but you totally know the very thing you did with us at our site almost five years ago was you said, let's do one of these. Let's see what different looks like. If it's not better, then keep doing what you're doing. But once we show them what different looks like, they like it. I think the biggest problem I see is once they see it, they want it for everything. Oh, yes. Right? So I want a learning team for every near miss, for every first aid, for every recordable. Yeah, well, you can't do that either. you got to pick, pick the ones that are yes. contextually rich that you can you know do good with. And I bet you see that at a lot of companies. That's a you know very provocative strategy. Let's let's do a learning team for everything, and it can overwhelm an organization if they're not careful about selecting yeah, or, what. Yeah, or what I see, and I think it's even more scary, is I, I see them wanting to formalize the learning team process. So what yes. really scares me is not that they want to do a lot of learning teams. Although that is kind of scary. It's that they want to make a procedure mm-hmm. or they want to make a form or they want to make a... Uh, they want a certain set of questions. Yeah, to a ask process yes. or certify coaches or... And and actually, that's a little more scary. But that's what we know. That, that's yeah, no, it's, it's, how, it's how we do work, right? Yes. And the, the funny thing is you want to tell them, you just do them. There's, there's no format. Just do it. Just do it. Well, I, I right? do require that all my coaches can do 40 push-ups and run a mile. And, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. That'll work for you. <laughs> in four days. <laughs> you know, they'll run a mile in four days. Four days. But that, so that, that's a little scary. But, I mean, you, your point's well taken, Marcy. That, that's, that's what we know. And, I, and I, I think what scares me most between us chickens is that I think people think that sort of the new view is learning teams. Learning teams is just a tool. It's a it's a really good or a tool, method, maybe and it's a method. It, it's a really good initial way to dip your toe in the new ideas. But eventually, it's really all about sort of understanding. It's about knowing how workers do work and realizing that the best people to answer your questions and create your corrective actions are the people who actually do the work. Yeah, I kind of look at the learning team as a bridge. It sort of bridges us over into this. It helps us get there. Right? It gives us something to go do with what we've learned about this new view. And you know, because you and I have talked about it a bunch, we do learning teams for quality near misses, for operational upsets. I mean, we do almost as many of them for non-safety things as we do safety. But we're, we're building in sort of that conversation. We're building in that confidence that we can collaborate better and blame less. And when production and operations co-op safety tools... Uh, that's a good sign. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about measuring improvement, 
that's probably a pretty good way to measure improvement. And, and, and the crazy thing about learning teams is they really do create very good small scale opportunities to change things with pretty low cost. I mean, they don't cost a lot of money. How about prototyping? Yeah. Why, why don't we prototype more in safety? Well, you, or really in reliability? In, in anything, why do we yeah. wait for the perfect, the perfect answer? answer? Mm-hmm. Well, it's that whole notion. I mean, you you are, you hear me talk about twice storming all the time. It's yeah. a lean terminology, but it's it is that notion of sort of small experiments or micro experiments or trying out your ideas. It's really interesting, but I think part of it has to do with and Marcy, please chime in on this one. I think part of it comes from this sort of fear of failure. We don't want to fail, therefore I got to work on it till it's perfect and then roll it out, as opposed to let me go try something and learn from what I tried. Yeah, it goes back to what I said earlier about letting perfect get in the way of right. good. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's a strong drive to aim high and hit the mark and this fear of not doing it right. and, and how that reflects on the organization. And, and I think we're looking for the, the grand theory. Right. You know, we want the big solution. And so we're, we're going to roll out a program, but we're going to roll it out co- corporate-wide. We're going to roll it out. The whole organization is going to get this mm-hmm. new program. And we haven't done even the simplest things you know, prototype it. I had a discussion today with one of your people, Marcy, who wanted to talk about the fact that they have a requirement for goggles and face shield, both at the same time, and that they can't really get employees to use the face shield. And I said, so what's the benefit of both? Because that's a reasonable question. Is there a requirement? Is it, you know, a compliance activity? Or did somebody say it's a good idea to wear goggles and face shields? Because, I, I mean, I, you can make a case for me that there are jobs that need goggles and face shields. But for the most part, goggles and face shields are the same thing, right? I mean, they're different, but they're right, the same right. thing. Impact ratings are different. Yeah, like that, right? but but it's kind of like wearing gloves and gloves, right? <laughs> or or underwear hat, and underwear. Yeah, wear a hat and a hat. <laughs> and um, And the guy said, well... You know, it's just a good idea. And I said, did you prototype the idea? Did you bring the drivers in? Did you talk to them? Mm -hmm. Did you let them try? Did they include themselves or were they included in the decision making? And it was really clear that the answer to all those questions was no. Well, it's the safety utility knife issue that we've talked about in the past where the headquarters guy says to me, this is the safety knife that you'll have everybody use. But we had already done experimenting in the field with the guys that cut boxes open with a dozen different knives. The one that he told us to use failed in the field. But to him, it made sense because it was a nice tool and it worked well in his office. He said, I tried it in my office. It works great. I said, yeah, but we tried it in the field. We experimented in the field with guys that cut open hundreds of boxes a day, and it fails. Or the engineer that runs an iteration two times and says it's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, I'm an engineer, so you're, you're, you're first of all, stepping on my toes a little bit. A little bit, okay. yeah. Yeah, but, but we would say, well, we designed it to go together fine, so it's like everybody else's problem except mine because I designed it to go together fine. On the drawing, it goes together beautifully, Todd. You just cared more. You, yeah, I am. I'm. If I cared more, I'd be safer. <laughs> so, is coaching vital to new safety? I mean, I think it is. Absolutely. Like yeah, absolutely. It's vital because you know we we've been living uh, the old view for so long. So the the coaching is imperative, and it's not a one time and you're done. Right. It's a constant reinforcement to prevent the drift. So you, back to our old ways. So how do you measure? How do you measure coaching? Well, uh, there's different ways of doing it, but uh, by having people ask to be on learning teams, by having your CEO quote about learn first and then act, by controlling our reactions to events, um, by involving the right people, you know, in various levels of the organization, and, you know, providing them training opportunities. There's lots of things that we yeah. can do. And you see the quality of the work that comes from a learning team. That's an indication of a coach and a team that got together and made it better. Mm-hmm. Somebody asked me recently about near misses. They said, well, if you're not measuring the number of near misses you get, then how do you know you're getting, you know, what, what do you measure? How do you know if you're getting, you know, because you know, I'm always talking about I want some good quality near misses. 
He said, but you don't have a number attached to that? I said, no. Well, how do you know? Well, I read them. <laughs> if I read them, I can tell. Are they a meaningful near miss? Is this actually something we can work with? Or is it somebody who says, oh, I got to turn in nine near misses a month. So, oh, Marcy's cup is a little too close to the edge of the table. There's my near miss. That's not helpful. But it gives me a number. I can get nine of those. I'll take two that are meaningful. How do I know they're meaningful? Well, because I read them. I look at them. Same thing with a coach. What, what do you see happening? Do you have people asking coaches to come over from the safety department, for example, and lead a learning team in the quality area because we had a near miss or an escape? I think that's an indication of whether you've got good coaches or not. So how do you learn to coach? There's a personality thing to it. I mean, some people are better at it, right? I mean, some people are better at it than others, but you can get a lot better at it. I've found that I've become a better listener. I caught myself already, even like to, now, the three of us sitting here talking, I catch myself already ready to say what I think I need to say instead of listening for a minute and actually sort of absorbing what you said and, and trying to respond to that in a more meaningful way. So we, I think some of it we can train ourselves to be better coaches. Yeah. I liken it to learning a new foreign language. You have to immerse yourself mm -hmm. in it. And practice so it. be around people that also share the same new view. That's good. Gather more information mm -hmm. through books or podcasts or conferences and ask good questions of the people that share the same view or are on the same journey. And I think that goes a long way in becoming a good coach. Very good. Hey, so let's hope that helps. Uh, it was a nice discussion, though. You think it's, it's a good way to think about these ideas of learning teams. Don't overthink these too much. That's my uh, biggest piece of advice for you guys. I think you can make them really difficult sounding and really complex. Oh, my God, this is going to be a big deal. And it's really not. It's getting the right people in the room and asking them what's the problem and what it is we can learn. And then having the right coaches there. To sort of keep the group moving and point it in the right direction and then collect the information that we need to get in order to actually make the improvement. Uh, special thanks to Marcy and to Bob and to anybody else who's done a lot of learning teams. It's all about this ability to learn. Learning is our most important weapon. But you know that already. I've said that to a million times. Don't be scared of these. Try one. Just go out and try one. I promise you, you will not fail. It may feel like you're going to fail, but you will not fail. Until then, have fun, my friends. Have the best time you can possibly have. Learn something new every single day. I bet you did today. Um, be good, be careful, and be safe. Oh, it didn't record. Oh, no, it didn't. <laughs> it totally did. It did. I'm lying.